Hello, everyone. Everyone is uh, ready for this uh, lecture. Uh, my name is Joe, and I'm uh, sitting in Tromsø in the north of Norway. You can see that on the first slide, uh, just to the um, to the right uh, on the lower part of the map. Um, and uh, today, uh, I will uh, tell you as much as I, I have time to about uh, Arctic mammals. Uh, and physiological adaptations in Arctic mammals. Uh, remember that um, um, mammals uh, have a body temperature of approximately 37 degrees, as we do, and they have lungs, as we do, so they need to breathe in air. And um, <clears throat> these two um, uh, special features, not special features, but they're special for mammals, of course, uh, they, uh, I will tell you more about how the Arctic mammals uh, are designed to, to live in their Arctic environment. And we will start with the true seals, uh, which are the super divers uh, among all mammals. And uh, true seals is uh, um, opposed to uh, sea lions and fur seals. Uh, you may, may have seen fur seals, they have a thick fur. Uh, and they uh, can stand raised on their uh, flippers like this. And uh, the reason for uh, them not being true seals is that they have a thick fur, meaning that they are more on land than in water, or more on land than uh, true seals. And they are also not that uh, adapted to a life in a marine uh, environment because they can stand up with their front flippers, while a true seal have to uh, can only do like this to, to move on land, uh, cannot raise itself. Uh, all seals uh, have evolved from dog-like uh, animals uh, that went into uh, the water to um, get food, probably, uh, maybe 500 to 1,000 to 1 million uh, year ago, years ago. And true seals also, they don't have an uh, ear uh, uh, flip. Uh, we have an ear flip, and many mammals do have an ear flip to collect the sound uh, from the environment. Uh, but true seals have only a hole uh, that uh, leads into the uh, that leads into the inner ear. So <clears throat> we have a, a mammal, uh, pretty much like us, 37 degrees uh, body temperature, uh, lungs, and they are super divers. Um, Humans um, are not super divers, as you all know. Uh, they might uh, go, we might go down to, let's say, 10 meters without diving equipment, and then our ears will hurt because we will have a pressure inside our middle ear. I will come back to that. Uh, also, uh, we have to uh, hold our breath and save the uh, oxygen that we have inside our body when we go down because we cannot breathe underwater and get uh, oxygen. Uh, and the record for an, a human, I think it's about uh, 12, 13, 14 minutes to stay submerged underwater. And um, um, that's a Danish guy, I think, which uh, is a very He's very fit, he's doing a lot of exercise, and he also do, does a lot of yoga, and he tried to trance himself uh, to reduce his oxygen consumption before he tries to set a new record. For a true seal, uh, 14 minutes uh, is nothing. Uh, they can stay submerged under, uh, stay submerged or stay underwater for almost one and a half hour. Uh, without uh, gills, like a fish, so <laughs> only with lungs. Stay submerged one and a half hour. And that was maybe the thing that uh, made me want to study seals, because I thought that was very amazing. Also, they can dive to 1,500 meters depth, uh, which is an enormous uh, uh, deep. Remember that the pressure at 1,500 meters is extreme. Uh, just dive to four meters in a pool and you will feel the pressure on your ears. So the pressure at 1,500 meters is extreme. So I've called the first chapter uh, a small dive uh, for one hour in ice water to 1,500 meters, something for you. 
And uh, this picture is from uh, the West Ice, in, um, uh, which is, uh, you can see here, I will try the pen, it's this area here, uh, east of Greenland, where you have drift ice, uh, which is ice uh, frozen uh, above, uh, on top of the water. So uh, there is 2,000 meters depth underneath, uh, underneath uh, this uh, drift ice. And in this area, uh, both uh, two true, uh, species of true seals, the hooded seal and the harp seal, gives birth to their uh, cups. And the reason for doing that in this area is that um, they will avoid uh, predation from polar bears that uh, goes along the shore uh, on Greenland here. Uh, they have the polar bear ha has uh, polar bears has a very long trip to get out to the seals, so they reduce the predation from uh, from um, uh, polar bears by giving uh, birth uh, in this area. So uh, you are going to dive to 1,500 meters in ice water. Remember that the temperature of ice water is on uh, in in the, in the salt uh, salt sea is minus 1.8 degrees Celsius. And the reason for that is that um, when you have salt uh, in uh, the water, uh, the salt particles uh, will um, prevent the building of ice. So you need to lower the temperature below zero degrees to uh, freeze the water. And then the fresh water will uh, freeze and uh, get out of the salt water. Uh, so all of this ice is is fresh uh, fresh water. So uh, you're going down to 1,500 meters. What do you need? You need something to do there, of course. And the seals are going to uh, go down there to eat. They need to go down to 1,500 meters to eat because the food is there, and it's fish and maybe squid they want to eat. Then you need to keep warm. Uh, I will come back to that. But remember that the uh, temperature is minus 1.8 degrees at the surface and maybe 4 degrees uh, at 1,000 meters. Um, you need to hold your breath long enough. Um, I will also come back to that because uh, uh, remember that um, uh, uh, you don't get any more oxygen when you are underwater. All the all the oxygen you have, you you get inside your body uh, before you dive. Uh, so you need to bring enough oxygen with you down there, and you have to do something about the pressure, which we already talked about. The pressure is uh, enormous at 1,500 meters. Uh, so, uh, what does the seal got that you don't? Uh, first of all, it got uh, much more blood. Uh, in an adult human um, weighing 80 kilos, we have approximately 5 liters of blood. Um, in a seal, let's say weighing 80 kilos, uh, it has 20 liters of blood. So, it has much more blood. And as you might know, uh, the oxygen is stored in the blood. So, meaning that the seal has uh, much more oxygen in its blood than we have uh, total. Also, in, um, in the blood, we have a molecule called hemoglobin, which is the molecule that stores the oxygen. Uh, the oxygen is binding to uh, hemoglobin. And uh, so the seal has not only more liters of blood than we do, but they have also thicker blood, meaning that they have more hemoglobin uh, in their blood. So not only total amount of uh, liters of blood, but also the amount of hemoglobin in the blood. So the blood is more viscous, it's more uh, tight, uh, meaning that uh, it's a little bit um, harder for the seal heart to pump this uh, uh, thicker fluid around the blood vessels. So remember, I, I will come back to that, but um, in the circulation system of the body, you have tubes, which is vessels, uh, and you have a pump, which is the heart, and the heart is going to pump
pump the fluid, which is the blood, in these tubes, so that all cells in the body uh, get uh, oxygen and uh, energy that the blood delivers. Just ask questions if there is something that you don't understand. So, uh, there is another molecule called uh, myoglobin, which uh, when you look at the word, it's related to hemoglobin, but it's called myoglobin. The globin is the same. And this molecule stores oxygen inside the muscles. Uh, you might know the color of the chicken meat. The chicken meat is white or very light in color. And the chicken meat has almost, or the chicken muscle has almost no myoglobin. Um, a beef uh, has, well, it's red, so it has some myoglobin, but the muscle of the seal is completely black. Uh, the reason for that is that it has enormous amounts of myoglobin inside the muscle cells. So the more uh, myoglobin you have inside your muscle cells, the more dark color. So uh, the seal has also uh, a lot of oxygen stored to the myoglobin molecule inside uh, the muscle cells. Uh, then <coughs> it has an ability to suppress the urge to breathe. Remember that if you go down underwater and you uh, may be in your bathtub and you try to hold your breath as long as you can, uh, can. we have all done that, I guess. Um, my record is maybe three minutes. Then I have to go up and, uh, and breathe again. Uh, so this ability, uh, this uh, urge to breathe, you want to breathe, you need to breathe, uh, is caused because you have, uh, as long as you're underwater, your oxygen concentration will uh, will go down. Your oxygen concentration will go down, and your uh, CO2, carbon dioxide concentration, will go up because you are not breathing and you're using oxygen and you're producing carbon dioxide. So when the oxygen goes down and the carbon dioxide increases, this is a signal to the brain that now you have to breathe. If you don't breathe now, you will drown. Uh, so this um, urge to breathe uh, can the seal suppress, meaning that the brain can just turn this off. So it doesn't feel that it has to breathe. Uh, the most important uh, adaptation uh, is uh, how the seal uh, uses the blood that it has uh, inside the body when it goes underwater. Uh, remember that it's going down to 1,500 meters to eat. Uh, that means that uh, the uh, digestive system uh, the stomach and the intestine and everything uh, may be empty, uh, so it doesn't need to um, uh, give uh, to to have uh, to, to perfuse or doesn't need to to send blood to the digestive system when there is no food there. So in a diving seal, um, the uh, amount of uh, blood inside is just going to organs that needs blood. And that means that when a seal is going to dive and stay underwater for one and a half hour or one hour, um, not all organs get blood or very, very little blood because it, they don't need it. I will show you a, a picture of this later. Uh, you might also know that when uh, you don't breathe uh, and you don't get oxygen, uh, lactic acid will accumulate in the blood. And this gives you the stiffness after you have been exercising. Uh, and in the uh, seal blood, they have a lot of molecules that can uh, bind the lactic acid, it means buffering the blood, because lactic acid is an acid. It makes the, uh, make the environment in the blood more uh, acidic. So. Uh, the seal has a lot of uh, molecules that can soak up 
this lactic acid. And so to the to the uh, problem with the pressure uh, for the uh, for the air in the uh, in the middle uh, in the ears. Uh, remember that fluid. If you have a balloon with water and you press this uh, balloon, then the fluid will come out some other place. It's impossible to compress fluid uh, as long as you don't decrease the temperature very much. Uh, maybe minus 150, you can do that in a gas bottle. Uh, but uh, fluid cannot be compressed, but air can be compressed. And when you compress air, you get higher pressure uh, on this air, uh, and this will be uh, painful, for instance, in the middle ear. You have an outer ear channel here, then you have a, which is filled with water when the seal dies. Then you have the middle ear, where we have the bones that uh, transfer the sound into the inner ear. And the inner ear is fluid, in, but in the middle ear, you have just air. So when you dive to 1,500 meters, and when we dive to, let's say, four meters, we feel a pressure in the ear, and that is because uh, the air pressure in the middle ear increases. But the seal has a very, very nice adaptation here. It has a small piece of tissue in the middle ear, which, is with, which it fills with blood when it dives. That means that the middle ear is now filled with blood, which is a fluid, and this as I mentioned, the fluid is in, you cannot compress fluid, so it doesn't feel uh, a pain in the in the ear. Uh, also, uh, the seal can lower the temperature of the brain. And um, um, when you lower temperature of a, a biological tissue, this tissue will reduce its oxygen uh, consumption. So when you reduce the temperature of a biological tissue, it will use less oxygen. And the brain is the organ in the body which uses uh, most oxygen. Uh, it's very dependent on oxygen. So if you can reduce the temperature of the brain, let's say from 37 degrees to 36 or 36.5, you will also reduce the uh, amount of oxygen it uses. So that's also an adaptation. And also it can, it has uh, the tubes that deliver the uh, 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 air down to the lungs, where the oxygen goes over to the blood, uh, is very strong. So you cannot compress these uh, tubes because you have maybe heard about uh, the bends, the diving sickness, and that's caused uh, by uh, uh, nitrogen gas in the in the blood, which is first pressed into the blood, but then gets out of the blood when the pressure decreases and the seal goes up, and this might blow some blood vessels in your brain, for instance, and uh, so you, so that's dangerous. So when the pressure uh, uh, when the pressure um, uh, uh, increases uh, and the seal dives uh, on, uh, at only 100 meter the um, pressure is so high that the lung is uh, completely compressed and all the air in the lung is now pressed out also all the air in the intestine of the seal uh, is also pressed out but on the other end so uh, at uh, almost just at 100 meters, all air is is out of the of the animal. Uh, <clears throat> this picture shows you on the left side it shows a diving hooded seal, uh, which uh, was filmed by the uh, BBC uh, program Seals of the World. It's a movie that you might find uh, uh, on the internet. You can it's some years old now, but it's a nice film and it tells you more about this. On the right side, we have uh, the Arctic fox, which is the best insulated animal in the world. On the left uh, picture here, you have a diving uh, hooded seal, 
which is uh, well, I tell you, I told you from the from the film Tales of the World, and on the right here you have uh, Arctic fox, the best insulated animal in the world. Uh, remember that uh, we will talk a little bit now about um, uh, uh, why the seal has so much blubber. Uh, remember that uh, this is ice water, uh, minus 1.8 uh, degrees, uh, and it's very cold. And also, water has a very high heat conductivity. And heat conductivity only means that it's able to conduct heat very well. So water has a much higher heat conductivity than air. Meaning that if you are in 20 degrees water, it's much colder for you than in 20 degrees air. So you have a difference in medium, air, water. And the main difference when it comes to body temperature is that heat conductivity of water is much higher. Uh, Arctic fox on the uh, right picture here, uh, if a hunter catch, catches an Arctic fox in a, in a trap and it's uh, frozen, it takes almost one week to thaw the uh, fox inside a room at 20 degrees because it's so well insulated that it keeps both the heat and in this, uh, uh, when it's frozen, the cold, so well inside because the fur, I will show you later a picture of the fur, it's, uh, it consists of a lot of hairs which you can fill with, airs, with, with air but also you have uh, uh, wool air uh, just close to the to the skin, and uh, the the fox is a small animal, uh, which is uh, well has a, a pretty big surface related to its volume, so it loses very easily heat. So it needs this fur to be very very good. But as you might know, the fur doesn't work in water, because what is warm with the fur, and what is warm with the jacket that you have, is that you heat the air in the jacket, and the Arctic fox will heat the air inside the, the, the fur with its own body heat. If you put on the, it's a cold day, and you put on a jacket, it's cold, the jacket is cold because it's been hanging outside, for instance, and then in the beginning it's a little bit cold, but then it gets, starts to get warmer and warmer. And that's because your body heat heats the air inside the jacket, and the temperature inside the jacket might be maybe 20 degrees, meaning that your surrounding temperature is 20 degrees, not minus 10, which is the air temperature. For the Arctic fox, a lot of people will always say, oh, I cannot understand how it can go around and have a good time at minus 40. The reason for that is that uh, the uh, surrounding temperature for the Arctic fox isn't minus 40. It's maybe plus 20 because the temperature of the air on, in the fur of the Arctic fox is plus 20. So the fur is the surrounding temperature of the Arctic fox. So the temperature in the fur of the Arctic fox is its surrounding temperature. Uh, but in uh, water, uh, you cannot use fur as insulation because uh, all the air that is trapped in the fur will be pressed out by the water. So uh, the seal has a very, the true seal, uh, which is a lot in water, has a very uh, well, the fur is not very good at all. It's just for uh, color marking and to show what kind of age it is and to show maybe the sex. Uh, but it cannot use the fur for insulation because all water will press away uh, the air. And then the seal has only one option, and that is to use the tissue in the body, which has lowest heat conductivity. Uh, you need a tissue which is not very good at conducting heat and you need to put it uh, uh, as far out as possible and of all the tissues in the body protein carbohydrates and fat fat has the lowest heat conductivity so but it's not very good so you need a lot of it 
I will show you a picture soon, but uh, the uh, blubber layer, which is just the layer of fat in a seal, might be 15 centimeters uh, thick. 15 centimeters thick. And it's put on the outside of the body to prevent heat getting out. So it has a lot of fat. But as you also can see, uh, the flippers here, uh, rear, uh, front flippers and the rear flippers, they cannot be uh, filled with fat because then you cannot use it. And the same with the uh, legs of the uh, Arctic fox. You cannot have a lot of fur here and you cannot have a lot of fat because then you cannot use it. So all Arctic mammals, uh, also we humans have it, but very bad, of course. But all Arctic uh, uh, animals and uh, mammals have something called countercurrent heat exchangers. Also, birds that uh, you are seeing uh, on a cold lake, sitting with their feet in cold water, have these countercurrent heat exchangers. I will tell you what that is. And uh, uh, warm blood uh, coming from the body, going down to the leg or the flipper of the seal. Uh, with oxygen and uh, energy, it's, it's warm, maybe 37 degrees, coming down. These blood vessels, here's five blood vessels, they are very close to five blood vessels going the other way, going with blood back to the body, from the leg. And when these blood vessels are very close, you can see that warm blood going that way, cold blood going that way, because this blood has been uh, cooled down in the leg. And the heat will now go over from uh, the warm blood to the cold blood. The cold blood will be heated going in, and the warm blood will be cooled going out, meaning that you get oxygen and energy to the leg, but you don't send the heat down there. So you keep the heat uh, inside uh, the body. Okay, understand that? So all Arctic animals have this, and they have very good uh, countercurrent heat exchangers. We have bad ones, but they have good. So they don't lose a lot of heat through their legs either. So what's the difference between water and air? Uh, <clears throat> here you see a picture on the uh, left side of a seal which is captured, I think this is the Faroe Islands, uh, and you can see how thick the blubber layer is here, and it uh, follows the, the whole uh, animal. So uh, the blubber layer in this case is maybe 10 centimeters, and it's uh, working uh, two ways. One, to prevent heat from getting out of the body, and two, as an energy store, because as you all know, fat has a lot of energy. So. And the fur is white and looks nice, but it's not very good at uh, trapping heat, and uh, you don't need that. Okay, um, <clears throat> to find out where a seal uh, can uh, swim, uh, we this is back to the uh, mid mid uh, mid eight, uh, mid nineties actually. It's almost twenty years ago. Uh, we uh, um, tagged hooded seals with a satellite uh, tracking uh, recorder. And this recorder was just glued to the fur with uh, ordinary glue, uh, and it will fall off when the seal uh, changes its uh, fur once a year. Uh, every time the satellite, uh, satellite uh, tracker is in air, it sends a signal to the uh, satellite that sh uh, shows where the seal is. And you can sit, I can sit in my office here in Tromsø and see where the seal is uh, right now. And this seal was uh, satellite uh, uh, tagged in the West Ice in this area uh, where it's very black. It's been a lot in this area uh, first, and then it starts to swim. And as you can see, it's, uh, this is just one seal. It's been swimming all the way up to Svalbard. It's been swimming down to Faroe Island and it's been swimming around and swimming and swimming and swimming huge enormous distances and this is within six months the swimming activity in six months 
meaning that, uh, of course, uh, these animals are excellent swimmers, uh, and they are in a very, very good shape, of course. And what uh, this uh, uh, satellite recorder also can uh, send signals about is how deep uh, the seal has been diving, because the satellite recorder has a pressure sensor that can uh, uh, show, uh, uh, that can um, uh, sense uh, the depth uh, uh, where it's been. And you can see here in the transect from Greenland to the Faroe Islands, uh, the seal has been diving uh, at approximately 1,000 meters. And in this area, it was diving a lot, meaning that it was a lot of food down here at uh, from 500 to 1,000 meters. And probably there's a lot of food here because of this under uh, uh, ocean uh, mountain, which will press a lot of nutrients and currents up here to the surface or closer to the surface. And there will be a lot of, of uh, fish here, maybe squid. Uh, this picture shows uh, a newborn uh, hooded seal which we have tagged with a modern uh, satellite tracker weighing, uh, I think, uh, 200 grams. Uh, and it's now put on the neck. Uh, the reason for that was that we, uh, we discovered that uh, the hooded seals were swimming a lot uh, on their backs. And uh, when they were swimming on the backs, the satellite uh, uh, tracker that we used to, to attach here uh, uh, was underwater. So that's why we needed to put it on the on the neck higher up, and we also put on an antenna so that the signal can uh, can uh, or the antenna can get out of the water more often because the the tracker can only send uh, signals when it's uh, in air. And this uh, will last for um, this is tagged in uh, March and will uh, fall off uh, next year in uh, March when they change their fur. This picture is from a placenta that I found on uh, the ice after a seal birth, and uh, it shows you very nicely the blood vessels. Um, and the blood vessels are first uh, very thick, and then they are um, like uh, leaves uh, in, in a like uh, nerves in a leaf from a tree, they get smaller and smaller to uh, uh, make sure that all cells in this tissue uh, gets blood and uh, oxygen and energy. This is just to show. And and if you, if I, uh, let me see here, if I uh, constrict this area, if I press this area, this vessel together, then uh, closed here and all blood will be stopped from going further down here. Uh, and this can be seen in uh, the lower picture here, uh, the left panel and the right panel uh, down to the lower left. This is uh, um, medical, I don't remember the name of the uh, apparatus that uh, takes picture of the seal, but uh, we have injected a fluid in the, in the blood that can be detected by this machine. And uh, this shows you, uh, this picture shows you uh, the aorta coming down here. Let me see the aorta coming down here. And there is blood vessels going out here and here. And this is when the seal is in air. Uh, the blood vessels uh, are open and blood is flowing through all of these vessels. When the seal is diving on the right, it constricts this blood vessel and this blood vessel and this blood vessel. This blood vessel here is completely constricted. Now it's gone, or it seems to be gone, but it's not. Uh, it's still there, but there's not any blood going in the vessel anymore because it's constricted. It's closed. And this one is uh, closed a little bit. You can see there is not so thick in this picture as in this picture. And also the thick uh, aorta here is uh, also uh, 
uh, closed from this uh, air picture. And as you can see on the right panel, shows you the percent change in uh, uh, blood flow to all organs when the seal dives. And you can see the brain gets uh, the same amount of blood, maybe more when it's dive when it's diving, but all other organs decrease its blood supply. Uh, you can see the spleen, the pancreas, the kidney, uh, the di diaphragm. All of these uh, decrease the blood flow maybe as much as 100%, meaning that the seal closes the blood vessels, delivering blood to these organs. And in that uh, way, it saves a lot of blood and oxygen for important organs. So a diving seal is uh, more or less uh, diving organs. When you constrict a lot of blood vessels, uh, the heart doesn't need to pump as uh, much as it used to do. So uh, that is called bradycardia, meaning that the uh, uh, amount uh, of uh, heartbeats goes down. So this uh, panel shows you before the seal is diving, the heart is beating at approximately 110 beats per minute. Then the seal is, is uh, uh, put under water and the heart rate goes down to almost just three beats per minute. When the dive is over, the heart rate goes up to the uh, original or normal value again. So this means that the heart rate goes very much down when the seal dives, and that will also save a lot of oxygen. This shows you a picture of the harp seal, which is the other true seal, that uh, true seal species that lives in this area in the West Isles. Uh, that's the mother in, in the ocean, and, uh, and this is the, the cup, the seal, uh, seal baby. And this uh, uh, species, uh, that's the seal uh, pup, it's born with a very good fur, a good insulating fur. It's pretty thick, it's white to keep it camouflaged from the polar bear. Uh, and the reason for that is that the mother of the harp seal gives milk to the uh, seal uh, pup for 14 days. That's not much, but 14 days. And during these 14 days, the blubber layer increases from maybe half a centimeter to 15 centimeters, 10, 15 centimeters. And when the blubber layer is thick enough so that it could be insulating for the pup, the fur falls off. So this thick fur is only uh, kept by this pup in approximately 14 days, three weeks. Then it will fall off because it doesn't need it anymore. All Arctic animals or mammals, if, it, if you don't need it, you get rid of it. So uh, uh, this is just to keep the pup warm until the blubber layer is thick enough. So harp seal gives milk to their pup 14 days. Uh, the next species, the hooded seal, which we have already talked a little bit about, has another strategy. Uh, this pup is born uh, with no thick fur at all. It has only a nice color, but it's not uh, good insulating fur at all, doesn't trap air. The reason for that is that this animal, the hooded seal, is a world record holder in a lot of different things. And one of the things is that uh, the mother is only together with its pup for five days. And that's the shortest uh, time period any mammal in the whole world uh, gives, uh, takes care of its, uh, of its pup. Uh, so when the mother um, gives birth, it has, uh, she is very fat. She has a lot of fat in the blubber layer. Uh, the pup is born and it's weighing maybe 10 kilos when it's born. And it doesn't have a, a lot of, uh, of fat in the blubber layer. But then it starts to drink milk from the mother. And 
uh, the model uh, model will shrink and the pop will swell and this will happen within five days so fat is uh, coming out of the blubber layer of the mother into the milk the milk is going into the pup and the fat in the milk is going directly to the blubber layer to increase the insulation of the pup but also to give it an energy store when the mother leaves it and uh, the record the world record of the hudi seal is that the pup increases its weight from 10 kilos to 50 kilos, five zero. It increases in weight with 40 kilos in five days. And uh, the, uh, the uh, milk is, is extremely fat. It's much more fat than cream. It's approximately almost 70% of fat in the milk. So mother shrinks, uh, pup swells. After five days, the mother says, no, have a nice life and it uh, goes uh, to into the sea to mate with the male. Uh, remember that these animals only meet uh, once a year uh, in March and they have to give birth to their pups and to give the pups enough energy to survive on their own and then they have to mate, they have to reproduce because they only meet in uh, once a year. So the male hooded seal which is approximately 400 kilos, uh, will guard the female and follow and, and just see, okay, when is she finished with giving milk to the pup? When she is finished with this, I have to, to mate with her. I have to reproduce because all uh, Arctic mammals will need to, uh, to uh, they want to reproduce. That's the goal of their life, to send their genes to the next generation. So he's waiting very patiently around the ice, uh, around the ice float where uh, she is uh, giving milk to, the, to her pup. Then after five days, she leaves the pup and they mate uh, in, uh, in uh, most uh, usually in the water. And he has uh, some, uh, 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 some uh, tricks. He has a, a skin fold under, uh, above his uh, nose which he can inflate to yeah, look impressive. And he has a red uh, balloon that he can blow out of his left nostril uh, to show the female that he is uh, in good health. The balloon color of his uh, uh, nostril uh, nose is uh, nice and red. So he is a good uh, male to mate with. And this is called secondary sexual characteristics of animals. Uh, anyway, they mate and he um, fertilizes her egg. Uh, and then um, they show a remarkable adaptation, which a lot of uh, mammals uh, have when they don't meet that often. And that's called delayed implantation. Remember, this is March and, they go, and she is going to give birth to her pup 12 months later, March next year. Uh, but the development of the fetus in a seal is the same as the humans, nine months. So how is that possible? Well, uh, the, it's called the delayed implantation and it means that the egg uh, of the female is fertilized by the sperm from the male, but it floats around in the uterus for three months before it attaches to the uterus wall. And the fetus cannot, cannot grow before it's attached to the uterus wall because then it gets blood, oxygen, uh, energy to grow. So it's like a, a satellite, uh, a fertilized egg, just floating around in the, in the uterus of the, of the female for three months before it attaches to the wall and starts growing. So that's a, a very special uh, adaptation and we don't know yet how that is possible. This picture shows you a polar bear that uh, came in this area and this uh, hooded seal male, he was very 
tough. He wanted to scare away all uh, all uh, intruders to, to because he wanted to protect his female. But in this case, uh, it was not a very good tactic because uh, he has no chance uh, against a polar bear. This polar bear is uh, maybe 800 kilos, and the hooded seal is uh, 400 kilos, but it has no chance against the polar bear. Uh, <clears throat> this is the last uh, slide. I see that time is running out. And this is just to show you a little bit, talk a little bit more about the fur. Uh, on the uh, picture to the left, you have a, a domestic reindeer, a reindeer that is living, uh, for instance, in North Norway. On the right picture, you have a picture of the Svalbard uh, reindeer, which is uh, ancestor from the uh, reindeer uh, on the mainland, uh, but it was trapped on Svalbard, which is an island, and it cannot uh, uh, ex exchange gene, uh, genes with other populations. And it has uh, evolved into a special subspecies of reindeer. And you can might uh, probably see the, the difference in the picture. It has shorter legs. Uh, the body is uh, more like a barrel uh, compared to the other reindeer. And the uh, nose and the head is smaller. And all of this is to uh, uh, prevent uh, heat loss because it's much colder on Svalbard. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, also uh, colder for longer periods than on the mainland. So there's two subspecies. And <clears throat> this picture so shows you just a, a, a schematic drawing of what we have talked about already, uh, the, um, how, how the Arctic mammal fur is designed to be uh, optimal for um, uh, preventing heat loss. You see the uh, guard hairs, they are long and they are ho uh, hollow to trap air. Then you have the dense under fur that prevents bodily heat from escaping. And then you have a darkly pigmented skin, which is important. I will come back to that in uh, just a small, uh, some small seconds. And then you have the blubber layer. So the blubber layer is insula uh, also gives insulation, but is also a very important store of energy. And uh, then you have the dark skin, and then you have the dense underfur, and then you have the guard hairs. This could be a, a picture of a cross-section of the polar bear uh, skin. And as you all know, the polar bears are white. And they are white because they need to be camouflaged when they are hunting for thieves. But it, it, the best thing actually will be, it would be to be black. Because as you know, if you're putting on a black t-shirt when it's a uh, strong sun, it's much warmer than a white t-shirt. And that's because the color of black absorbs all uh, heat uh, energy, while the color of white uh, will, um, uh, will uh, push back all uh, heat energy. But when you have black skin and white fur, like the polar bear uh, and uh, the polar fox, uh, you, you get both because the white skin will give you camouflage, but the heat radiation from the sun coming down here will reflect be, be reflected from white hair to white ha hairs and then absorbed in the black skin because the black skin absorbs all the heat energy. So you get both. You get camouflage and you absorb all the heat that you can from the sun at the same time. Okay, I don't think I have time to say anything more, but uh, so I think we are finished. So uh, thank you uh, everyone for listening. Uh, any questions?